Hello, hello, and welcome back to another episode of Pizza and Property. My name is Todd Sloan, and we've got an extra special episode today lined up for you. This is our very first Unstuck Yourself episode. If you rewind back a couple to the episode with David Liston, where he unpacked a ridiculous story about $500,000 being transferred to the wrong account, we announce our very first winner. I now have Dan actually sitting across from me. So I'm going to keep this intro really, really short so we can make sure we actually pull apart his whole situation and get this man unstuck so he can keep growing his property portfolio. And if you're wondering right now, what is unstuck? What What is Todd talking about? Click the link in the show notes below because if you're at a point growing your portfolio where you're thinking, you know, I could actually use a little bit of help. This whole competition revolves around basically helping people from where they are now to getting them to where they want to be by putting you in front of a team of different experts. And our team today is Jordan DeYoung from Game Plans, who's going to run us through a game plan of exactly where Dan is now, or Dan and Jess, I should actually say, your wife Jess as well, where, where Dan and Jess are now and where they want to be with a very detailed plan. Next, we're going to be talking with Morgan Bushell from Full Circle Finance, who is going to then be talking to us about borrowing capacity, what kind of yields we need to get. I don't know why I'm saying we, it's not my portfolio, it's a dance, but, but what kind of yields need to be achieved, how all this is going to work from a lending perspective. Then we're going to be talking with Oliver Jackson from Living Property to then start matching up. Well, how are we going to start achieving those yields? What kind of strategies need to be put in place? Where are we needing to, to buy to actually make all of this happen? Because the thing that's got Dan stuck is analysis paralysis. And I think that this was, was such a common factor that we saw with all of our entries. Some people were stuck, like I said in the episode before, it was, uh, I'm at three or four, I don't know how to get past it. I'm, uh, we even had a few entries that were like, I'm at 10, I don't know how to, to keep growing after that. But the amount of entries that we actually had where people were just like, I, I don't know where to start. That's why I really wanted to get Dan on here because he's one of these people and we want to get the ball rolling because otherwise everything else is is doing it right. We're talking to him about listening to podcasts. Dan and I had dinner last night and having a really good chat about it. And it's like that the analysis paralysis will unfortunately is something that I relate to so much because I was there for such a long time. And if I didn't have that help to actually pull the trigger to get unstuck, I wouldn't be sitting here, I wouldn't be doing this right now. So if you're in that situation as well, where you're possibly overthinking things a bit, or if you know someone that's maybe over, overthinking things a bit as well, send them this episode, because I can guarantee you this, there's going to be a few key takeaways in here that are going to make you go, oh, I didn't realize that. Maybe that's one of the things that's in your way that's going to help you get unstuck. Or if you want to be sitting in the seat with Dan, actually no, Dan will have gone home by then. So you won't be sitting in the seat with Dan. But if you want to be sitting in the studio with me, potentially getting unstuck as well in front of a panel of experts, click the link below and make sure you enter the competition. Tell us how you're stuck. Actually, yeah, that's just it. Actually, just tell us how you're stuck and that's all you have to do to enter it. But right now, Dan, you're across from me, man. How you going? Good, good. Thanks for having me. Yeah, thanks for, for actually just like putting up with the introduction. I feel <laughs> it's, I've never had someone sit in the room with me as I do that. <laughs> It feels a little bit strange, but can you uh, tell us a little bit about yourself, uh, yourself and Jess, your situation, where you've come from? If we can start with a bit of background, man, it'd be nice to get to know you. Sure. Um, so, yep, Dan, married to Jess. Um, we've been married since 2010, and we've got two kids, a uh, little boy, four years old, uh, and a little girl uh, who's one and a half, and they're, uh, they're great kids. I am an ADF veteran. Uh, I was in the ADF uh, since 2004, uh, left in 2016, so just under 13 years. Moved into more of a project management uh, discipline from a career point of view. And so you actually got deployed as well from what you've been saying? Yeah, so I uh, deployed in 2009 on uh, Op Okra to uh, Afghanistan. Uh, I was based at uh, Kandahar there for a short period uh, and then a couple of other deployments. So uh, Operation Southern Indian Ocean, which was in support of uh, the search and rescue operation for uh, MH370 and uh, Op Okra, which was uh, in support of the neutralization of uh, ISIS in the Middle East. That's incredible, mate. And and so this is why I feel it's it's really interesting as well because it's it's not like you're a stranger to solving problems. You're you're not a stranger to hard work uh, at all. But um, can you expand a little bit on on what's actually got you stuck on the portfolio side? Yeah, yeah. So I think it really came down to uh, probably the aha moment. Mm -hmm. um, I think it was probably just really in the the passenger seat from a uh, financial point of view, and I really wasn't driving anything in particular. Um, one day I listened to the book or audio book, uh, Rich Dad, Poor Dad. Good book. That, yeah, that was my aha moment mm -hmm. <laughs> when I went, hey, I'm approaching you know, 40 and I've got zero assets and I've only got liabilities. 
um, that's that's not a good position to be in. So from there, it's kind of been a journey of um, needing to uh, work on a, an investment portfolio. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, we chose property because you know we know property, we like property. Houses are just cool. Like it's it's part of the Australian dream to yeah. own a house and all that kind of stuff. And yeah, so that's kind of been where our journey has started. But it kind of has hit a bit of a, a blockage in terms of what do we actually need to do to get that started? And I guess the pressure of of time for myself as well, you know, approaching 40, I want to get that portfolio absolutely humming as quickly as I can Mm -hmm. um, to get the best outcome as quick as possible. Everyone talks about that foundational property being so incredibly important. Um, So that's probably got me in a little bit of a spin as to what I need to do for that initial uh, investment to really kickstart and be that foundational cornerstone for that uh, investment portfolio and that's when I keep going around in circles in terms of um, you know what what should we buy where should we buy um, how much should we spend and, and all those kind of things that have really just you know the wheels have just been spinning in the mud but so to speak just to um, I guess to, to kick that off um, there's, there's a lot of information out there you know you scroll through Facebook and you see all these ads where it's like oh you can pay your home off in in seven years and mm-hmm. not pay any tax and it's like who do you believe? Um, yeah. and, and it just kind of gets a little bit confusing because there's so much noise out there. Um, and I think, to be honest, it, it feels like sometimes um, whenever we look at some of these, um, you know, property professionals, quote unquote, yeah. um, that they're just trying to like make some money out of your investment portfolio on the way. Flog their wares kind of thing. Correct. Yep. Um, so so we, we, and I guess probably most people are quite discerning at the moment in terms of where their money goes, mm-hmm. given, you know, cost of living is up, interest rates are up. So, um, people are really probably careful with what they invest in. So yeah, that's kind of where we're at at the moment, and and we just kind of we're just not quite sure where to start because we we don't know how to be able to hit the goal that we have or or when that will be. So and if I've understood you correctly, it's not that you don't know where to start through lack of trying. It's that you don't know where to start because you have been trying to educate yourself, and it's just like information overload. Correct. It's like podcasts, audiobooks. Um, you know that's that's where I get a lot of the information. You know, there's a lot of information through you know social media and things like that, and it's it's now at the point where I've just ingested so much. Um, mm-hmm. It's really hard to pick out the wheat from the chaff and to really understand what's actually going to you know provide value for me in in my investment journey. And it's good information that I need to grab and and implement on that journey. Excellent. I got the same thing with diets. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> You, you read one thing about being a vegan and then you read one thing about the carnivore diet and it's like, it all makes sense. You're like, which yeah. one do I choose? Yeah. Like, so I, I get you from a totally different level. So we're going to be kicking it off like, by talking with Jordan Dijong from Game Plans. Now, Jordan normally doesn't do game plans. He normally does these well, like through BAs. It's actually whenever you, you get the help of a BA, it's, it's a part of the service that Jordan offers them as more of a B2B. So the fact that he's actually gone through this with you, is that right? Yes, yeah. Awesome. Okay, and so we're going to be unpacking your situation as far as where you're sitting now financially and then the goals of where you're wanting to get to. Personally, I wanted Jordan on board for this because I think that if analysis paralysis is the thing that's holding you back, a clear plan is one of the best ways to move forward because you can actually see how to move forward then. And and I don't, there's literally, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but there's, I don't think there's actually any other software out there in the marketplace that does it the way that Game Plans does. Not that we've found. And that's no. probably the thing that we've found probably the most helpful so far is to be able to have a look at that from a, uh, a whole plan point of view. All right, so let's jump into the call with Jordan and start unpacking a little bit more of where you are now, what's got you stuck, and how we can get that section of things unstuck before we move on to chatting with uh, Morgan Bushel from Full Circle Finance. Jordan de Jong, how you going, mate? I'm very, very well. Excited to be speaking to you two, that's for sure. Mate, we're just as pumped to be speaking to you because this is the kickoff moment as far as I'm concerned. Like you and Dan have been having a bit of a chat over the past, what, week, two weeks, two weeks, two, two weeks now. There's a few, actually, there's a lot of data that's been getting processed in the background. And I'm keen as a bean to see what it's really resulted in, what a few options you've got in front uh, of Dan and Jess now that they can take. And I guess really that next step of getting him unstuck from the analysis paralysis side of things. So are you right if we just kick it straight over to you, mate, and you, yeah, show us what you've been doing? Let's roll through. Yeah, we've definitely been doing some uh, some number crunching and I've been very thankful of both Jessica and Dan for letting me go through everything. But um, 
the original set out for this is just understanding what their, their goals were. And so some of the things that we were looking at was a, a desired retirement age of about 55, okay. uh, which giving any, any much age away, it's between like 15 to 20 years. So we got a little bit of a time up our sleeve. Okay. Um, we had a, a target passive income of a hundred K per annum. And that was in today's dollars. Um, and then Jessica mentioned that they were looking to potentially have at least sort of seven properties in the portfolio. Um, but I, I kind of challenged that a little bit and just said, look, most people can achieve their goals within three to five properties. And let's map that out and sort of see what that looks like for them. But can I jump in then, Dan? What, why seven? It was kind of a bit of a pluck. And and that was part of the whole analysis paralysis that we were kind of in. So we weren't really sure what it would take to achieve our goals, whether it was seven properties or three or two or 50. Um, so we kind of went, Jordan said, hey, what's your kind of starting point? And we went, seven. Okay. <laughs> and, and, and that was kind of it. So we, and, and then Jordan then, then kind of took that as, you know, it's a starting point. And then he kind of challenged it and went, okay, here's what you actually need. Excellent. Okay. So seven was just something that's like, well, this just feels like it could be a, a good goal to, to work towards. And Jordan's kind of reverse engineered, if, if, I'm, if I'm looking at this right, and gone, well, look, if 100K passive is the target, this is the time frame we're looking at, like seven might not actually be what you need to shoot for, correct? Okay. So Jordan, I was looking at you then. And I realized you can't see me. <laughs> <laughs> it's all good. Uh, some other key touch points was um, there's nothing major coming up financially over the next couple of years that might impact the plan, which is really good. We've got some good forecasting that we can do. Um, they were happy with the 90% LVR, so happy to uh, take advantage of a little bit more lending if we have the ability to do so. And we do ask about sort of what they're looking for for the next purchase. So they mentioned that they were looking for a house, at least sort of three bedrooms, um, around 350 square meters or larger. And mm -hmm. they had a price target of a 700K range, which is actually quite spot on uh, looking at the data when we get there moving forward. Um, the interesting thing about this purchase is they mentioned they would potentially like something in Newcastle, but they were open to buying in any other state. And so the interesting thing about this is looking at their existing property in their portfolio, uh, it's already in Newcastle. And even though I love Newcastle, I love the data coming through, it's a, I think it's a great region. Um, when we look at a portfolio holistically overall and we start to map out, you know, zoom out and take a 30-year approach, we do want to implement a little bit of diversification, which means that they can take advantage of two different property markets. And when they go through their different cycles, they can take advantage of them as well, rather than just being prone to one area or one location. Okay. Before we jump into the data side of things, Jordan, just a quick question. How did that make you you guys feel when it came to the, the borderless side diversifying? Because I'm just thinking right now, if the thing that's got you stuck is analysis paralysis, all of a sudden that's opened up more options rather than less. So how did that work for you guys? So uh, I, I think it kind of came down to um, Newcastle is what we know, um, but understanding that there's a lot of data out there that you know Jordan and the guys have that can actually help us understand what is available in all these other regions it kind of breaks down that, uh, I guess, you know, misconception for us that we need to invest where we live because there's enough data to support, um, you know, an acquisition somewhere else. Um, and in talking to, you know, particularly Ollie as well, is how do you then manage that? How do you purchase a, a property that's, you know, far away from where you live uh, and, and it gets managed remotely? So that was a little bit of a paradigm shift for us and, and a bit of a change in our, our mindset in terms of invest where you live. All right. So basically Jordan's putting the, the plan together. You're looking at it going, okay, seven, maybe it's not what we need. As far as borderless is concerned, it, I, I'm instantly thinking that was going to be more scary and potentially like not help, but that's helped because it was explained with the data, with the plan and everything was kind of pigeon paired together. Yeah. So, it, and, and it really draws back to that analysis paralysis, right? So I, I, I know I'm approaching 40. Um, I won't say what age. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and, um, you know, I, I, I don't have any assets. Like I, I really essentially only have liabilities. Um, so for me, it's, it's all about I need to build a portfolio in the quickest amount of time that I can because I know property takes time. I know that the market needs to go through cycles. I have a limited amount of time to be able to plant the seeds of this portfolio. And I actually may never uh, be able to sit in the shade of the trees that I plant today. But I hope my kids and my kids' kids can do that. Mate, that's poetic. Did you write that before you came? No, but it, it, it's really about, you know, what am I building here? Um, am I building something that, you know, hopefully the goal is I can enjoy the fruits of that investment. But if not, my kids are going to benefit from it and their kids are going to benefit from it. 
Very well put, man. I like that. Look, Jordan, if, if we can jump into a bit of a, a how Dan and Jess are, are going to get there as far as the plan's concerned, can we look at a bit of what you've put together, mate? Yeah, 100%. Um, I think the, the the biggest thing about, uh, I've shared my screen now, so hopefully everyone can see that. But um, the biggest thing is just understanding, you know, where they were from an equity position now, and what, how we might be able to cycle this equity. So the good news is they did buy in, in 2020 before the, the big COVID boom, and uh, they purchased their principal place of residence for around the 770k mark, or 1.1 1, 1. 1 million and 50. And we'll wait for a proper bank valuation for from the mortgage broker, Morgan, um, to get a clarification around that. But, you know, even then it's performed at 36% since they've purchased it, which is a compound growth rate of 10.9%. Um, the Australian average is about 6.8% over the last 30 years. So we talked about, look, that might level out over the next couple of years, but it's a really good kickstart to their portfolio. Um, and their current debt's still only uh, 570K, which is a 54% LVR. So really, really good front in terms of an equity starting position. And what that means in terms of the, the essential portfolio and, and where we could start is we do have a bit of borrowable equity. So if they were able to refinance based on the current valuation uh, at an 80% LVR, they should be able to extract about 840K. Um, their current debt is 570K, which means we do have access to around 270K for borrowable equity to allow us to continue to build the portfolio now. The biggest pain point that I asked Dan and Jessica was how far does their current salary get them? And I think it really came into conjunction of, well, we've got this equity now, um, I don't know where our current salary is going to be able to take us over the long term. What is the next best play? Do we get into these seven properties and go for a high cash flow? Do we get into three or five and, and, and build it out that way? And so we'll, I really wanted to address that analysis paralysis and, and, and just being stuck on what do we do next? Mm -hmm. And so we put an initial plan together. And the initial plan did a fair few things. But at a very high level, we were looking at around that 700K purchase price this year. Now we cap all of our capital growth rates at 5%, which is very, very conservative based on that historical average of 6.8. The only thing that we need to address with this purchase is we're still looking for a bit of a higher yield because we are looking at that retirement play in 15 to 20 years. So I've put in a, a minimum target yield of 5% here. And can I just quickly jump in, Jordan, and just say if anyone's listening on Spotify or iTunes right now and they're if you're finding it a bit trickier to follow along, jump onto YouTube because there's a screen share of exactly what Jordan's put together on the game plan side of things that you can see very clearly. I, I love this, mate. Sorry, sorry to cut you off, but if, yeah, if you can keep going, man, this, this is really good. No stress at all. Um, and so, you know, with that 700K range, we just discussed, look, if the broker does come back and say that you can spend 750 or 800, what that's going to allow the buyer's agent to do is just have a much bigger pool of assets that they can select from around the country. And because we do have that little bit of a, a higher yield at 5%, we want to be open to all the different areas that we can possibly get into. From there, we allowed two years just for some time to accumulate, savings to accumulate, equity to build within the portfolio. And we put a second purchase in 2025 at 500K. Mm -hmm. Again, we're going to put the rate at 5%, but we're going to target for a little bit more of a high yield at a 5.5% yield, which is generally a little bit easier at that sort of 500K range. Mm -hmm. And then we did a final acquisition. And this is when we're really going to start to move to that higher income range. Now, the reason we want to move into this higher income range is because after this second purchase, Jessica and Dan, based on their current salary, will be capped out in terms of a borrowing capacity. And so when we go for something that's a little bit more higher passive income, it can come in the form of a commercial asset, which requires a, a higher deposit, yes, but we mm -hmm. can also get different forms of lending through lease stock loans and everything else like that. So we put a final purchase in, in 2028 for 550K. We're going to target a 4% compound growth rate, again, which I know is very low, um, but a, a high rental yield of 7%. And if we're going for commercial, that would be a net yield as well. So three more acquisitions over a five to six buying window. What this then frees them up to do is in terms of a savings position, they stay above their buffer line, which means they've set a buffer at around 100K, meaning they're always going to have 100K cash on hand, which is the most quintessential thing so that they can sleep at night. The second to this is in terms of a passive income story, they actually are quite neutral all the way through given their, their current position. And then when we do hit this passive income goal line at the age of 55, they get to generate around 60K worth of passive income. Now, their goal was 100K of passive income at this age. And if we actually inflation adjust that 100K, it's probably going to be closer to 150K in that 50-year time horizon. I had to let them down and say, we're not hitting our passive income goal. But we had a discussion around, look, 
If we went for a high income focused portfolio from the get-go, we would be able to get there. And Jess and Dan basically came back to me and said, look, we really want to have a balanced portfolio. And we're happy that even if we don't hit our goal by the age of 55, what we were able to forecast out is by the actual you know, retirement age of 62, they'd be generating around 218K worth of passive income where their inflation target would be about 176K. So they're actually generating more passive income than their target based in today's dollars. They're paying for their principal place of residence and they're heading into that retirement stage of life. Just to jump in quickly there, so, sorry, Jordan, uh, but that, that jump there, mate, if you can move the, the mouse off a little bit, and again, for anyone listening on iTunes or Spotify, it just all of a sudden goes zoomp and, and skyrockets. What's going on there? So this is when we uh, Im implemented super coming into our personal name rather than being the self-managed super fund. And we're essentially completely paying off our debt at that uh, retirement age of 62. Right. So that eliminates any debt on the portfolio yep. and we're just living passive income coming through. Makes sense. Okay. Uh, and, and can I ask then, Dan, why was it that you guys wanted more of a balanced portfolio rather than going for, for more of the cash flow side of things? Like once you guys started looking at the plan in more detail, what made you feel more comfortable with that? I think it was really around um, making sure that we still had options. So if we went too hard on the, the capital growth side of things, it, it really limited our options and then started to be a quite a big draw on us from a financial point of view. Um, with the balance, we can still have at least a, a decent lifestyle and balance that with the portfolio kind of taking itself from a cash yield, like a yield point of view. Okay, makes sense. Without that uh, uh, that self-managed super fund income coming through, or not self-managed super, but super coming through, mm -hmm. uh, we ended up creating about 156 just with the portfolio by itself as well. So it was just a little added, added benefit to pay off the remainder of the debt in the portfolio. Fantastic, man. All right, so as far as the, the unstuck side of things, Everything revolves around analysis paralysis. I, I already feel comfortable for you looking at all of this. <laughs> so, so this, I think this was actually probably the, the biggest eye-opener and, and the biggest helper for us to understand what our options are um, and for Jordan to take us through this and go, okay, here's where you can play with some things. Here's how you can tweak the plan. We, we probably can't hit the age of 55 where you've got your 100K and you're you know, sitting on the beach somewhere. That's okay. Now I understand that, you know, in a few more years time, I just see out the plan and then we achieve our goal. But I can't just, you know, there's been a number of times when I've heard kind of podcasters and stuff like that just say, pick your goal and then reverse engineer it. And, and it's really not helpful. That's all well and good. Um, but this particular, I guess, platform that Jordan's got um, has given us a really broad picture of the plan um, and it's not just the investing it's, it's it really looks at at everything so you know where our super is at when that's coming through how that contributes to the portfolio things like that um, and it's really helped uh, I guess Jess understand where we can go potentially as a family from an investment point of view so it, you know Jordan can explain all of that a lot better than I can um, and it's really helped her from a comfort level point of view. So she was a bit nervy to begin with? Well, she, she's less in, not less invested. Um, it still affects her, but she's, um, she's probably, you know, she's not listening to podcasts every day like I am. And yep. she's, okay. she's probably not as, like, well, yeah, she's, she's not as invested in this particular journey. She's happy for me to, to run with it and do the research side of things. Um, and, and this gave us the opportunity for, um, I guess, Jordan to lay that out for her to help her understand what the options were and what the journey looks like for us. I guess it's kind of like you ever watch a, a stand-up comedian's routine and then you try and tell your friends at work and you do bits and it's like, it's not funny. It's the same, you, you're putting in all this education for yourself, you're watching podcasts, you're, you're reading books, but then you try and then reiterate what you've learned it's not the same thing but i'm kind of picking up that this this is actually like watching it but it's not watching it as a whole because she doesn't have the same kind of interest level i think yeah. it's fair to say yeah. um but it watching it's watching it as a tailored uh, sort of tailored package for your situation which is what's giving her the comfort correct okay all right jordan well, is, is there anything else that you wanted to, to add on to this mate and also what questions uh, we need to take when we're talking with Morgan next for the broking side of things? I think the main thing is, you know, they're really set up for that longer term goal. They're actually going to hit their goal over that, that longer term journey. And so um, if things do change, as Daniel mentioned, they can come back into the system, update those things, fiddle around with some numbers and update their projections based on the things that do change. But I think the biggest thing for Morgan that we're going to follow through next is just understanding what is the absolute maximum that we can purchase next 
at a comfortable level where they've got enough savings and based on what the, the lenders will allow us to have. And just getting into the best possible asset that we can next that's going to help build and aid this plan as we as we start to go through the journey. Love it. Jordan, thank you so much for jumping on the show, mate. And thank you for personally running through this with Dan as well, because I know this is something normally the, the BAs will actually do on your behalf. So to actually have you do it with him, mate, really appreciate you spending the time. Thanks, Jordan. It was incredibly helpful for us. <laughs> no worries, guys. Good luck. Thanks, mate. All right, Dan, what'd you think of that? That was great. It, it, it was so helpful. Um, that the process with Jordan's actually been the, the biggest area to get us unstuck. That's probably built for us a lot of confidence in, in terms of understanding what the plan is, what our options are, even where yep. we can tweak it um, and how we can kind of really build on that um, that investment portfolio. Can I ask, what were some of the biggest aha moments? Because like sort of thinking about a portfolio is, is one thing because there's so many different moving parts. Having like a visual representation, what did you you and Jess look at and you're like, oh, wait a second. I didn't know that. Like, do you know what I mean? The penny drop moment. I think it was how our offset can be used, offset account can be used, um, where our super will drop uh, and how that contributes to the portfolio in, in terms of paying things off um, mm -hmm. and just how we can establish a buffer and um, how we can manage the finances from that point of view and make sure that we don't go below that buffer or, um, you know, what's our risk appetite? Can we can we dial it up a little bit more and, and, and look at the plan and restructure it a little bit? And what do you feel that your risk appetite is now? Do you feel it's it's kind of come down or gone up? Uh, I, I think it's probably gone up a little bit. When we, the risk appetite's low when we've got low confidence and, and we're not sure what we're doing. Now that we've got a plan in place, the, probably the risk appetite's a little bit higher because we understand what our position is and what we're trying to achieve mm -hmm. um, whilst our risk profile is probably lower because we we know um, you know what to look out for. Our risk appetite is probably a little bit higher, mm. so you know might be able to to dial it up in some areas and go okay, um, where can we maybe put another property in there? Is is it fair to say that you you're looking at it as being less risky now that it's more understood? Yeah, yeah absolutely. Because I I had that with skydiving when someone actually explained it all to me, and it's like. You, you've got, what is it, a 1 in 101,000 chance of dying skydiving and a 1 in 6,000 chance of dying in a car accident. So it's like you've got more odds of dying on the way to the drop zone than jumping out of the plane. And there's obviously a bit more to it than that, but but once someone actually explained all of the safety mechanisms in skydiving, like and, and you, you've got a military background, I don't know if you, you know anything about AADs? No. Now, AAD stands for Automatic Activation Device. So if, if you're falling at more than, I think it's 70 miles per hour below 1,000 feet or whatever it is, I can't remember the exact numbers, your reserve chute automatically pops. Yeah. If you don't know about stuff like that, it sounds terrifying. There's, there's the similar equivalents with stop losses when it comes to portfolio building, which I feel that now having the game plan in front of you gives you that visual representation to go, oh, wait a second. Now, if that happens, we, we can just do this. Yeah. Like, here's the safety buffers and... I feel like is that what's kind of given you a bit more confidence to up the risk a little bit or the perceived risk? Yeah, I think so. And and even just Jess and I are visual people. Um, you know, we, we learn probably a little bit easier through visual as opposed to, you know, just numbers on a spreadsheet. This gives us the ability to really understand and not just look at it from a, a ones and zeros point of view, but really understand what that portfolio can look like, uh, which was super helpful for us. Love it, man. All right, well, let's kick off into, well, actually, we've already kicked off. Let's pass the ball, if I can keep a football metaphor going. I don't know anything about footy, so let's just <laughs> do my best. Uh, on to, to Morgan Bushel from Full Circle Finance. Um, ready to have a chat with him now? Let's do it. Morgan Bushel, it's time to talk finance. How are you, man? Good, Todd. How are you? Yeah, really good. Thanks, man. Well, I'm pumped to actually see what we can do for Dan as far as the, the borrowing capacity and lending side of things is concerned. Jordan's just put a kick-ass plan together with all of the information that Dan and Jess have put into game plans. And now it's time to find out, I guess, what's actually possible and what maybe is a little bit like, okay, we, we need to, to refine the parameters. So actually, before we get into it, did you have any questions for Morgan at all, Dan? No, no. It, Morgan's been a great uh, help so far. Um, it's just really good to be able to see, hopefully, um, what our options are within our borrowing capacity. Perfect, man. Well, let's let's kick it off then, Morgan. Where do you want to start? Yeah, I think probably a good place to start would be, yeah, just initially some of the things that we kind of unpacked with Dan and Jess. You could probably start a little bit there and some of the hurdles that we had to kind of uncover to really, I guess, get them unstuck. So... Yeah, shall we dive into it? Yeah, let's do it. Cool, cool. So, yeah, I think at least from my end, um, I, I mean, I don't know about you, Dan, but 
when we were kind of looking through things, I remember one of the first things Dan kind of mentioned was uh, there was a certain value expectation for what their property was worth and then mm -hmm. how we could kind of use that to snowball to the next property. And I think the main thing was when we actually then looked at some of the banks and what they then valued the property at, uh, we actually got some really like really high values compared to what they estimated. So I think that was probably the first thing that really kind of stood out. Um, what about you, Dan? Yeah, I think that was that was kind of the good news story out of that. Um, yeah. We we had a yeah. we kind of had an estimate as to what we thought the the property value was, and we kind of just took that off, you know, domain. Like one of those auto val kind of things. Yeah, like you can just look up your own property and go home, you know, home price guide or whatever. And we went, yeah, that sounds about reasonable. Um, but then, yeah, obviously um, Morgan helped us out with some of those valuations, and I think I think all of them actually came up more than what we had actually anticipated, which is fantastic. What are we talking more, like 20 grand more, 100 grand more? What was the difference? I think the lowest one was 20 grand more. So that was the lowest one. That was the lowest. It was, was the 20 grand more than our estimate. What was the highest, Morgan? Uh, so the highest actually came in, uh, look, if we're allowed to name banks, um, it was actually CBA. So they came in the highest um, and it was quite a significant amount compared to, I guess, all the others as well. So if 20 grand was the lowest, Morgan, what, what are we talking about for the highest vow? Yeah, so the highest vow actually came in a $127,000 higher. Um, and that's quite a big difference compared to the lowest that we got. That's a massive difference. And considering what was it, usable equity was something like 270-ish. Was that right? So Yeah, pretty much. I mean, oh, yep. Oh, I was just going to say, sorry, man, to jump in. If you were to go with the lowest VAL or like uh, the, the RP data, or not RP data, so you said domain, I think it was yep. uh, domain yep. report, it would be very easy for you to go, oh, we actually don't have usable equity to, to, to go forward. Yeah, so that's obviously given us a lot more equity to play with. So that really gives us a broader set of options um, now that we can you know, take the equity out. Because if we had have just gone with, you know, that's our valuation, the equity position would have been a lot lower and we kind of just go, well, let's maybe sit on it for a while or not bother or, you know, now, now that we've got a realistic um, value of the property and what our equity position is, mm. the options are open. Fantastic. All right. What, what, was, um, what was next on the list, Morgan? Yeah. So I think that was kind of the main one, but then it was really knowing with that amount and those kind of valuations, what the ripple effect is and I guess how the portfolio planning piece, especially from a lending perspective, kind of plays out. Because some people kind of know how much I guess they can work with, but then what that means from like a, a borrowing capacity perspective. So I think just generally speaking, it was kind of like a, a real aha moment uh, mm -hmm. once we kind of mapped out what that all looked like for the next uh, investment property. And, and Dan and I were having a little bit of a chat this morning where we we're having a coffee and there was something that you'd put together as far as possibilities as well, which was, forgive me if I got this wrong, it was like three if you want to sort of go a little bit softer with it, but potentially four if you want to push a little bit more. Can you expand on a bit of that as far as the options were concerned? Yeah, so it's like it's something that we kind of do as an extra thing for property investors and really it's just taking uh, borrowing capacity and really showing how far that can go with the number of investment properties you may potentially buy. So there's quite a few, you know, I guess, uh, parameters that we work with. You know, at any point in time, this can all change. Like there's a number of variables we're dealing with, but it's really just to show a lot of people how far and how many properties they could technically service. Because not many people actually know where their limitation is, but then once you kind of have that pathway set out, you can kind of adjust things or tweak them to keep going or maybe, you know, build the ideal portfolio from a bank's perspective because we're all kind of limited by how much the banks want to lend us. So, yeah. And what, what were the tweaks that Dan and Jess really needed to focus on? Was it more the capital aspect or the yield aspect or? I probably would say it's more the, the yield, if any. I mean, with investing, it's one or the other. Mm. Uh, so for them... Once we'd kind of figured out the value of their property and how much we had to use to go forward, it wasn't actually really a question of how much equity or like cash we've got to snowball. It was then, okay, what sort of yields do we need to maybe target if you wanted to keep buying more? So it was mm -hmm. more kind of a, a cash flow uh, play more than anything. Okay. And Dan, can you talk us through, once you started going through this with Morgan, uh, how what was like the the feeling with, with Jess as far as going, okay, did it click? Did it take a little while to understand? Like, can you kind of walk us through that bit? 
So I guess the the presentation that that Morgan put together was super helpful, um, especially for I, I guess for both of us, because um, it gave us those option sets. So he he said, you know, if you go with the the game plan sort of structure that we've, you know, we sat down with with Jordan mm-hmm. and go, yep, potentially your first property value might be this, and you can get two more. But is, here's another scenario where you can actually maybe reduce the uh, the value of the property on the first one and you might actually be able to stretch your borrowing capacity across four. Um, mm-hmm. So the overall portfolio value might be a little bit higher. Um, and within that presentation, it really spelt out for us, you know, the value of the property that we'd be going for, um, how much cash we'd have left over in equity that we could use as our, our buffer that can sit in the offset. Um, and it really helped us from a, a risk profile point of view um, understand what that looks like. But at the same time, I can then take those two options that he gave me plug it back into the game plans, you know, tool mm-hmm. and I can see how that now maps out if I change to that second option that uh, Morgan's put together for us. Gotcha. Okay. So basically the, the game plan kind of put the overall picture into perspective and then by chatting with Morgan, it's now sharpened it up with more like, I guess, what what kind of a, a yield, what kind of properties, but we still don't know where, hence the next chat with, with Ollie, then it's yep. about really refining it even further. Correct. Okay, and and as far as yields that they need to really stick in to keep growing, what what are, what are we looking at? Four percent, five percent, six percent? Yeah, like I mean, when we did our modelling, we'd like to kind of go a little bit conservative. So it's always nice to have a six percent rental yield, but um, we like to kind of go a little bit more conservative with our modelling. Uh, so I think with Dan, we went between either like four to four and a half percent. Okay. Normally, when clients do use buyers agents, they can normally achieve more than that. So yeah. Perfect. Okay, so the the bar's pretty reasonable to to achieve as well. It's not like it's been set super high and you have to nail a 7% yield to make this all happen. And is there anything else that you wanted to add for to this from a lending perspective and, and anything that sort of mushes together with the analysis paralysis side of things? Because you must see this all the time, people coming to you and it's just more of a, like, I don't know where to start. Yeah, that's it's quite common actually. Um, and one thing that I kind of like to do is, apart from just seeing the numbers, because that kind of really puts things into perspective, sometimes it's just about education. Normally, when I do present to people, I show them a lot of tools and resources that they can really help to, I guess, level up their investing knowledge and maybe where they can find more like-minded people, self-educate. Um, I mean, to a degree, if you do too much of it, that's where the paralysis comes in. But I think when you do actually meet like more like-minded people, that's kind of where it does really help because you can kind of re- leverage their knowledge and um, really just kind of get that extra uh, sounding board, I guess. So that's the sort of extra thing that we kind of, I found at least with um, Dan and Jess. All right, Morgan, well, as far as uh, the questions to take from here next over to Ollie, what are we looking at as far as is there certain parameters uh, like um, what we're shooting for yield-wise, uh, purchase price, all that kind of stuff? Yeah, so the sort of purchase price we're shooting for is about 750000 Okay. I think realistically the yield we're most likely probably going to see is about 5 but we're probably going to stick with our usual four to four and a half percent rental yield just because it's always better to aim a little bit lower with pre-approvals uh you know when you go back and the numbers look better the bank's always going to like that so it makes the process from our end and from the client's end a lot easier as well perfect all right so about a 750 purchase price and we're looking at about a a four and a half if we can get a five percent yield happy days Definitely. Awesome, man. Look, Morgan Bushell from Full Circle Finance. Thank you so much for jumping on the show, man. It's always a pleasure to have you. Thanks, Todd. Appreciate being here. All right, Dan. How's that chat feel? Great. Good, man. Really good. I've got to ask, what are the biggest takeaways from you guys? Because to me there, that valuation's got to be a key piece for you. But but what what were what were your biggest ones? I think probably the key takeaway for I guess myself in the kind of stuck position is or anyone else who's in the same position as me, talk to a mortgage broker who focuses on investment properties because they're going to help you understand what your actual position is, what your equity position is, what your borrowing capacity is. Because otherwise, like myself, you're just kind of working off assumptions mm-hmm. and then you know you're working off assumptions. So you've got low confidence, right? Whereas if you go to a mortgage broker, you speak to them, then you have a clear understanding as to what your actual capacity is. And they can really help you understand what your option sets are after that. One key piece of this as well, and, and just for anyone listening, I really want to highlight the the fact that it's, it's talk to an investment savvy mortgage broker. 
not just any mortgage broker. Like Morgan has built his own portfolio. I forget what he's got now. I think it's about six or seven rentals. It's it's three or four million dollars. The guy understands it from a walk the talk perspective as well. Because there's a lot of mortgage brokers out there that I just like. If you knocked on my door and said, "Hey, Todd, I want to buy a PPR. Who would you recommend?" There'd be some great ones I could put you in front of. Yep. But I'd never put you in front of them for a mortgage broking capacity on the investment side of things, because more people like Morgan understand when you can potentially tap yourself out and then how to avoid that kind of stuff to keep going. Yeah. And I think probably one of the other things is it wasn't a, this is the end. It's, Hey, this is where we potentially tap out on yeah. our borrowing capacity. Oh, by the way, here's some options that you can undertake to potentially increase that. So yep. it wasn't a, this is the end of the line. It's a, this is where we get to the end of this particular line. Uh, this is how we then adjust the plan to be able to increase our borrowing capacity. And how did that make you feel from like the comfort perspective? Did, when you kept going on the, the borrowing capacity, naturally, the debt keeps increasing as well. So I've got to ask, did you start looking at that going, well, oh, wait a second, like that's that's a few million dollars worth of debt or how did that feel? Yeah, so I, I think it's um, something we're growing to be more comfortable with. Okay. Um, initially, like when, I, when we first bought our PPOR, you, you see that mortgage debt and you look through your bank account and there's this massive minus number and you go, oh my God. Um, yeah. and, and that kind of is a little bit scary. But when you then understand how debt can be utilized to grow your portfolio, mm -hmm. that becomes a whole lot less scary. And, and was that kind of the, the rich dad, poor dad lesson? Yeah. Like, yeah. 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 That was kind of the aha moment about how debt can actually be used for good, so to speak. Yep. Um, and can be used to build a portfolio. Whereas we grew up, you buy a house and you pay it off. And that's kind of it. You you have debt. Debt is bad. You get rid of it. Um, yep. Whereas now we're a lot more comfortable with um, potentially taking on more debt. Okay. So next step is to start buying the properties. It's like we've got the plan. We've got the understanding of the finance, yep. how we can obtain it, how much you can, all the rest of it. So it's now like let's start moving forward to, to the buying side. So we've got Oliver Jackson from Living Property. You've already had a bit of a chat with Ollie, but it's time to actually go and break open a bit more of the detail as to what, where, and how it's all going to work, mate. You ready to chat with him? Ready. Oliver Jackson, time to talk property. How are you, mate? Good, mate. Thanks for having me. Always a pleasure to be here. Mate, thank you for jumping on the show and thank you for taking so much time uh, talking with Dan and Jess about their situation. We've already been speaking with Jordan about the plan. We've got the the big picture. Then Morgan about the the financial side of things, knowing what they can borrow, what kind of yields they need to hit. It's time to turn the, the mic over to yourself for the strategy side of things. What are they doing? Where are they buying? All the rest of it, man. So is there anything you wanted to set the stage with before we start talking about the details? Yeah, um, man, this is a really common thing that happens that I, I think when it happens to people, they think they're the only one where analysis by paral paralysis by analysis, it um, it's such a common thing. There's, uh, you know, you've got the media, you've got friends, family, everyone loves to talk about property, positive, negative. So it really conflicts people on what they should do. Um, man, a lot of, there's a lot of money in Australia. A lot of people have good jobs. So people can buy property, but a lot of people just overanalyze the whole thing from start to finish that mm -hmm. this is such a common thing. And it's a really, really good um, episode. I think for a lot of people, they'll take a lot of value out of it. So from my side of things, he's got a really good borrowing capacity um, and their future is obviously looking really bright once they get over this hump of just over analyzing everything. What I'd be doing, um, obviously you've spoken to Jordan earlier. Um, I'd be taking that money purchasing in Adelaide or Brisbane, because I believe they've already got a property in Newcastle. So it's obviously good to diversify um, different markets move in different times. So over the time, they'll end up probably having one in each state. Uh, I think they're looking at around that three to five properties for retirement. Mm -hmm. um, so with their budget um, and with the rental yield they need around that four or 5%, Adelaide and Brisbane right now are really good um, locations. We'll be looking for a, a house on the biggest block of land we can find to say six to 600 square meters to a thousand square meters and obviously renovation potential so we can increase that equity and increase that cash flow to then buy the next one. I've got a few questions around that, but before I actually start asking mm -hmm. my questions, Dan, how does that make you feel then, Adelaide and Brisbane? Obviously, we already talked about going borderless. You said that seeing the plan made you feel a bit more comfortable with it. Yep. But does which city sort of change that comfort level at all? Or what are your thoughts? No, not necessarily. And I guess we're guided by what Ollie can provide in terms of his expertise. Um, so whether it's you know the data that sits behind it to say, hey, look, 
you know, Adelaide or, or Brisbane is, is going to grow by potentially X amount of percent, mm-hmm. you know, this is a good place to get started because then in a couple of years or, or even 12 months, you'll have a, a bit extra equity and you can use that to move on to the next one. So for now, I think we don't particularly care where it is. Yep. Um, it's what's going to achieve the outcome the quickest for us. Okay. So you've really gone straight to, to being outcome focused with it. Yep. Love it. Okay, so as as far as Renault's concerned, what would you suggest, especially considering the the stuck portion of this for for Dan and Jess was analysis paralysis? How how Renault are we talking, Ollie? Because I can see Re- Renault being quite an intimidating thing if you go up to the the higher rungs of it. So are we talking just like keeping it simple, like carpet curtains, paint that sort of thing? Or what do you got in mind? Yeah. Well, you don't want to, you know freak everyone out on the first go. <laughs> yeah. So it honestly depends um, on the property at the time where we decide to buy, what area it is, what properties we can actually find. We're obviously going to try and find something off market. So it's going to be case by case on which property we actually do find. But I, the largest thing we'll do would be curtains, blinds, curtains, uh, floors, paint, lights, kitchen, bathroom, you know, just a cosmetic renovation. Mm-hmm. Nothing crazy. Um, that's as big as we'll get, as small as just painting the joint, putting some lights in. Um, it really just depends on the property, but we're not going to go anything bigger than a cosmetic renovation. Okay, and can you talk us through a little bit of the equity uplift? Is is this more so done for that, for, for their particular situation, or is it more uplifting the yield or a bit of both? Definitely both, yeah. So you know, when you renovate, they say you know you want to put in one dollar to get two dollars back. We might not have to do this renovation straight away. But we might find a property that doesn't need a renovation, and we can do it in three or four years. We might find a property that now's the right time. If there's already a really good tenant in there, you know, and they get paid paying reasonable rent, uh, we're not going to kick them out just for the sake of doing a renovation, putting the rent up if we don't mm-hmm. need to. Um, so it's really going to depend on the property. It will depend on when we do the renovation, but just having that added value potential. Um, it doesn't matter how much money you've got or how many properties you've got. You always want to look for extra value, value adds in a property. So if it's, you know, it got a nice purple bathroom from the seventies, but it's in a really good condition and someone's <laughs> happy paying the, the high rent there, then there's nothing wrong with that. We can do the renovation at some stage. It's that option there. Unless the, the Joker from Batman is your target market then keep it purple. <laughs> <laughs> you can double your rent. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, and how does that make you feel, Dan? <laughs> it, it's good. And I, I think through our chats with, with Ollie, it's kind of broken down that perception that we need to be on the tools to do renovations. So there is the ability to purchase a property remotely, have it renovated, and we don't miss out on our weekends and things like that. Um, that was probably okay. a, a misconception on our part that when we think renovations, we think you know on the tools, you know on weekends and you know weeknights because that's how we've done it, just helping our family do just their own renovations. Mm-hmm. Um, so that was probably uh, one of the big aha moments for us was, you know, there is the ability to purchase a property somewhere else and and still have it renovated. I don't get any more calluses on my fingers. Yeah. Um, and and we, we get that uh, that uplift, so. Okay, and as far as areas are concerned, Ollie, I know you're not talking like specific suburbs because, I mean, you, it's, it's still a way in the works anyway, but are we talking more mm. like... North city fringe, like dirty south, like how how far? And I feel like I can say dirty th- south because I'm originally a southerner. <laughs> <laughs> how, how far in or out are we talking for like Adelaide and Brizzy? Um, so Brisbane, let's say we go between that six fifty and seven fifty mark. You're looking between say eighteen and twenty seven kilometers north of the city, mm-hmm. um, and Adelaide. To be honest. Probably about the same, maybe a little bit closer. So mm-hmm. that twelve to twenty k's, mate. To be honest, north and south, like Adelaide's great. Not so. Man, I know you say dirty to south, but Adelaide's a pretty good market everywhere. It's just got its good and bad locations. Yeah, but it'll be around that fifteen kilometer radius around the city. About fifteen kilometer. Okay, so we're still keeping things in pretty good proximity. We're not. We're not going out too far. There's no regions, anything like that. Yeah, you know, maybe up to twenty five k's max. Just really depends which budget we go with and at the time when we decide to do it, but yeah. And can I ask, does that make you feel more or less comfortable, indifferent? How does that sit with you, Dan? Kind of indifferent. Um, uh, And and that's where it comes to, um, I can only get myself so far and it's really leaning on the professionals to help us make the best decision. So I know the buck stops with me, but being guided by Ollie in terms of where the best, you know, place within Adelaide or Brisbane is, 
um, and what that distance out is. You know, for me, that's that's good, right? If we're looking at a fifteen kilometer radius from the the CBD, that's that's fantastic. That's not far at all. Up to twenty five, that's probably a normal commute for most people. Okay, so we're looking at a, a pretty reasonable radius of the the CBD for either Brisbane or Adelaide. We're looking at a, actually, and lastly, I was just going to say we're looking at a four percent yield. Do you think that's too mm-hmm. low, too high? Where, where uh, not too high, definitely. But do you think that's where where would that sit for you? Four to five and a half percent. Four to five and a half. So obviously, when we buy the property, let's say let's just say we buy a property that's already got a tenant in there, yeah, and they've lived in there for fifteen years, mate. Mm-hmm. They might be paying two hundred fifty dollars a week under what the rent is because. People, gotcha. a lot of people buy property for fifty grand. They've had it forever, and then someone's paying rent for five years. It doesn't really bother them so much. Mm-hmm. Um, so there might be a little period there where it's a little bit under rented until we can either that move that person on. So yeah, it really depends. But you want between that four and five and a half percent, both in Adelaide and Brisbane. They both have very good rental yields for cities. Perfect, man. And is there any kind of final words of wisdom or anything you'd like to to add to this before we part ways today, Ollie? I guess the most important thing for people out there who are in this position, which is very, very common, maybe talk to a few different professionals, like friends that have actually done bought property, um, different buyers agents, different mortgage brokers, and kind of get their advice. They're the ones on the ground doing the work every day. Don't listen to your friends and family who might not have done anything for 15, 20 years. Media is always, you know, up and down like a yo-yo. So how do you know what they're actually what they're actually talking about is right at that time? Mm-hmm. So just talk to random professionals and friends you've seen who actually done it or are doing it at the time. So you don't get stuck thinking about doing it for 10 years and then the market's tripled. So, yeah, really important just to get advice from different professionals um, who are actually doing it day in, day out. Instead of well-intentioned advice from people that don't know what they're talking about. 100%. And listen to podcasts by Peter Property. Is it like that's where the unintentional people that give bad <laughs> advice to? <or? laughs> don't listen to Todd. No, no, no. If you want to give good advice, good property podcasts. <laughs> Oh, mate, Oliver Jackson from Living Property. Thank you so much for jumping on the show, mate. Um, yeah, and thank you for helping out Dan and Jess. Really appreciate it. No worries, man. It's always a pleasure. Thank you very much. Thanks, Ollie. No worries. Thanks, Dan. What do you reckon that, Dan? Good, good. I'm uh, a lot more confident in us to be able to get started on our journey now. Um, I think it's all starting to come together. Absolutely, man. And and looking at this, so the budget's basically saying around Adelaide or Brizzy, sort of that inner circle, but not too inner. So still a little bit on the outskirts, but you're not going totally regional. Yep. But you were saying that you'd still be comfortable with that if that was where the guidance led you? Yep. Okay. Yep. Right, and I think you sent me a text, and this is something that I, if it's cool with you, I want to read out. Uh, Dan actually sent me this, uh, what was it, last night. And it was here, key learnings, because I said, let's have a bit of a think about it before we start recording. Like, What were the biggest takeaways from all of this? And I want to try and read this word for word. I'm a terrible reader. Let's, let's, let's go for it. Key learnings. Overall takeaways. Number one, the aim is to hit the target. Jordan gives me the bow and a target. I have a target point and a tool to aim with. Number two, Morgan is the drawback on the bow. He helps me provide enough tension on the bow to hit the target. Number three, Ollie is the arrow helping me hit the target by executing the tactics that achieve the strategy. And number four, I can get more momentum in a team in two weeks than I can by myself in 12 months, particularly as a starter. Additionally, it helps with learning to do the do and learn to. I like that. Do the do and learn to. I think you wrote that perfectly. And, and you, you told me before you don't write, do you? No. No. I, I <laughs> I'm love, not a writer. I love that analogy, though, of, of the, the bow and the arrow and the everyone's separate little piece and how they work in that. And can can you expand a little bit more on that? And I, I guess tell me a little bit more about what you mean. And yeah, yeah. So I guess the session with with Jordan and and the use of the game plan. So game plans for me is that that bow. Yep. Um, and it helps you know gives us gives us a target that we need to be shooting for, and gives us a tool being the the game plan um, to be able to aim for that target, um, which has been super helpful. And that's probably the the biggest learning point that we had out of this whole journey um, over the last couple of weeks is really just putting something in place. If the, if the plan changes a little bit, that's fine. And it but will. We, yeah, we, and it evolves. Yeah, life changes. Exactly, right? yeah. Um, it's like project management. They never, yeah. go to, never go to the plan. Exactly. Um, but if we've at least got a, a, a baseline that we can start working from, um, we, we can really start to tweak that plan. But we were just so lost in terms of understanding how we can actually set a target and, mm-hmm. and aim for it. 
and then um, you know the input from Morgan is he helps us understand you know how far we can pull back on that bow and and put the tension in um, to the arrow, which will be Ollie um, to be able to help us find a, a property. So it's it's really understanding the the strategy that's in place, and then what are the tactics we're going to use to achieve that outcome. And and on the Reno side, you're still keen to to get the renovating but not hands on the tools this is going to be more like project management style yeah if we, if we can avoid uh giving up too many weekends yep. uh that would be great like i i do like the hands on aspect but now that we've got two kids um i'm quite busy with work um we we just don't have the time at the moment um to be able to do that so that's a that's a great option for us that we can still um, look at renovating properties, but not be on the tools. Well, and, and if you could sum up like the whole experience so far, what's what's some kind of like words of wisdom as a bit of an outro? And I don't mean, I'm going to ask you an action step in a second as well. And and don't forget, there's another important question coming too. But, but what I, I guess describe the experience from how you've gone from typing on like, hey, I'm stuck and, and describing your whole situation to now... I can even hear the confidence in your tone has changed from when we very first spoke. Can you kind of give us a bit of a, an overview for that for anyone listening that feels like they're in a very similar situation? With pleasure. Um, and I think it really comes down to taking the time to talk to the professionals. I can, I can only take it so far um, in my journey because I'm not immersed in the, the, the property scene. You know, I, I work in project management and I don't, um, you know, I don't come from a mortgage broker background i'm not a real estate agent i've I've bought a house twice in my life Mm -hmm. uh, and that was our pporz and i'm i'm not fully immersed in that environment so for anyone who's like me uh and you would like to invest in property but you still you know you're not in the property game in in some way shape or form is is get a team together um assemble that team and, and start to work through kicking off your journey and you know we've we've done more in the last like two weeks that I have in, in 12 months of trying to formulate a, a plan on my own. That's insane. Like it, it was a one hour session with Jordan to go from zero to here's a plan. Yep. We know we're going to tweak it and it's not going to necessarily go exactly to plan, but it was yeah. like, it was a massive eye opener for us in terms of what we can actually achieve. Dude, that's brilliant. And that, that makes me smile so much to, to hear how much this has changed like, and, and in such a positive way. What, what's your action step? For anyone that's listening right now, pulling out the headphones, yeah. getting to it straight away. Don't pull out the headphones. Okay. Pick up, pick up the phone and talk to maybe it's a it's a Morgan and understand your financial position. Maybe it's a, a Jordan um, or or an Ollie um, to really understand where you're at and what your options are. Um, if you're like me, who is particularly lost in terms of um, understanding what the the target point should be and mm-hmm. and how to hit it, set up a session with with Jordan and like that game plans tool was, was amazingly useful for us. Um, and I think it's, there's only so much that I could get out of podcasts and audio books and that kind of stuff. Yeah. There's an aspect of self learning that's on me. Mm-hmm. Um, but there comes to a point where I am, I'm stuck and I need to hand over to the professionals to help me on the journey. Like the buck stops with me as, as the investor, mm. but I need to come to a point where these guys are doing this day in, day out and then hand over the reins to them to help me on that next step of the journey. Okay. I, I'm, the only part of that that I have to say, unfortunately, if you are listening and thinking, yeah, okay, I'll jump on a call with Jordan. That was a bit of an exclusive uh, invite for yourself. Jordan <laughs> actually doesn't normally do those. So to take the exact same thing of, of, of uh, what Dan's just said here, jump on a call to get a game plan, but you're going to have to do that through a BA because that's not a B2C uh, service. That is a, a B2B like service that, that exists. Well, actually, no, I guess that's B2B for, for Jordan to, to business. But anyway, you're going to have to talk to a BA to actually get a game plan session put together. But it sounds like that was one of the, the biggest helps that you've got. Absolutely. I, I love it, man. And and if I can ask you arguably the most important question of the entire show. Dan, what is your favorite pizza? Uh, my favorite pizza is probably the Moroccan lamb from uh, Crust. Moroccan lamb? Yeah, it's good. Okay. Yeah. Mor- a Moroccan bit of lemon on top. It's fantastic i have not had that i've only just recently started eating meat again and it's like aladdin it's like a whole new world <laughs> <laughs> well you should definitely try the moroccan lamb it's I, great. Th- I think we've got a couple of crusts here left in adelaide i don't think they're they shut down a few but we'll, it's, a, it's a little bit more bougie than Domino's. yeah 
<laughs> not as much of a deal though. They're a bit more, a bit more expensive. A little bit they? more. Yeah. yeah. Okay. All right. Well, Dan, thank you so much for coming on the show, mate. And thank you so much for taking the time out to actually fly here, uh, spend a night. It's been an absolute pleasure. And thank you for kicking off the very first Unstuck Yourself episode. Uh, thank you, Todd. And um, thanks to everyone who's helped us along the way. This has been an amazing journey and how far we've come in the last two weeks. Um, has just been absolutely phenomenal. So thank you to everyone. Um, thank you, Ollie, Jordan, and uh, and Morgan as well. All right, guys, I hope you've enjoyed this episode because like I've said at the very start of the competition, this is just episode one of at least six. This this might even keep going. So if you have listened to this and, thinking, and started thinking, actually, yeah, I am a bit stuck. I can see how this all works now. We've got a bigger picture. Make sure to click the link in the show notes and tell us why you're stuck. Because, oh, and we've just corrected something as well. It was brought to my attention earlier, actually by Dan, that it said there was a 10-word limit. There is not a 10-word limit, and that's my mistake for anyone that's only putting in 10 words. Please give us a bit of a description. You don't need to write war and peace, but if you can give us a paragraph or two letting us know a bit more detail, it helps us when we're actually choosing who's going to be sitting here. Okay, so we'd love you to enter. And if you have entered before, enter as many times as you want. And if there's someone else that you're listening to right now, think, or not listening to, but you're thinking of, thinking, I'm not stuck, but my mate is, send them this episode. Send them the link so they can enter as well. Because we want to keep doing this for as many people as possible. And it's going to be different situations every time. So today, it was about helping someone that had some pretty bad analysis paralysis, which now I'd like to think is completely removed. It, actually, is it removed, Dan? Dan's still sitting across from me right now. But yes, he's nodding. I'm good. I'm <laughs> <He's>, good. <okay. laughs> but that is enough from me today. My name is Todd Sloan. This is the Pizza Property Podcast. Have an amazing rest of the week and stay awesome.